pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you, Color Guard. Good afternoon, and welcome to our gathering around Half American, the epic story of African Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad. I'm Karen Long, manager of the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. We are here to learn about how history matters, a phrase our guest of honor uses in all his classes. And because it does matter, let me acknowledge where we are, the traditional homeland of the Lenape, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Miami, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and other Great Lakes tribes. Their stewardship made our lives possible, and we recognize the thousands of their descendants who live here now. We are also here because of the generosity of the Cleveland Municipal School District, specifically the hospitality of our hosts, Historic East Technical High School. Its leaders are here. To welcome you is principal of a storied place, Dr. Tamujan Taylor. Please come up, thank you. Good morning. How's Good morning. everyone? Actually, I guess it's afternoon now. So um, as I said, I'm Dr. Tamujan Taylor. I serve as one of the co-principals here at the East Technical High School. It is truly an honor to be the venue for the Cleveland Foundation and the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards presentation for Half American, written by renowned author and professor Matthew F. Delmont. We would like to welcome the Cleveland Book Week community the greater Cleveland community, our East Tech community, and our special guest, of course, Professor Matthew F. Delmont. I have a personal connection to Professor Delmont's work. Like all the men that he wrote about in his book, I too am an African American male. Ooh, I can't even get it out. I am too also an African American male veteran of a foreign war. I serve uh, during Desert Storm. I also have uh, my professor of military science, Colonel Williams, who has the color guard. He is also a veteran of foreign war, Desert Storm. <laughs> Although we didn't face it adversely like the men in this book, some of the experiences I read about resonated with me because these gentlemen paved the way for both of us. So I would like to say to Professor Delmont, job well done. We appreciate you. So again, <laughs> on behalf of the administration, staff, and the scholars of the East Technical High School, welcome to East Tech. Thank you. World War II wasn't just a battle of strategy and will. It was a battle of supply. Without the contributions of black Americans, the army couldn't move, shoot, or eat. Everything passed through the hands of at least one black soldier. We know this because of half American. And we know it because this exacting, beautiful, and yes, infuriating book comes to us from Professor Matthew F. Delmont. He is the Associate Dean of International Studies and Interdisciplinary Studies at Dartmouth College, as well as its Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor of History. 
Half American is his fifth book. His first was The Nicest Kids in Town, an exploration of race and culture via American Bandstand in Philadelphia in the 1950s. Our interdisciplinary scholar was born in 1977 in Minneapolis, went to a military high school, then to Harvard and Brown universities. He is a specialist on the black press, which led to the idea for Half American. The title itself comes from a 1941 letter from James Thompson, a 26-year-old cafeteria worker in Wichita, Kansas. On the cusp of being drafted, Mr. Thompson wrote a letter to the editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, quote, should I sacrifice my life to live half American, he asked. Will things be better for the next generation in the peace to follow? Would it be too demanding, too much to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for sacrificing my life? Thanks to Professor Delmont, I know this. There's a saying that we all die three times. First, when we stop breathing, second, when we are buried, and third, when our name is mentioned the last time. Because of Professor Delmont, we are saying the name of James Thompson and a good many others like him in Half American. Join me in wel welcoming Professor Matthew F. Delmont. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Karen, for the nice introduction. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for your introduction as well. I had a chance to tour the culinary facilities here at East Tech, and they're just remarkable. Um, what you and your staff and students are doing here is uh, really an inspiration. So I appreciate you hosting us here for the event today and for giving me a tour beforehand. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to the Color Guard for bringing in the colors. And thank you for all of you for turning out on a beautiful Saturday here in Cleveland. Um, this is my first time ever being in Cleveland, um, and I can't say more about how much I've appreciated the warm uh, welcome that you all provided. The award ceremony on Thursday was remarkable, um, and I'm looking forward to our time together today. Um, I should say, hopefully you were able to pick up lunch on your way in. Please feel free to eat if you haven't had a chance to finish your lunch yet. This is meant to be uh, not the most formal occasion, but a, a chance for us to sort of engage in history and, and talk about it. Um, I want to start in the same way I started at the awards presentation on Thursday. If you only remember one thing from our time together today, it's what I tell my students in the classroom all the time, that the stories we tell about the past matter. It's why it's so important to engage with history and engage with it honestly. The stories we tell about the past matter. I want to start today by talking about where this book came from. It actually grew out of my last book project. Karen mentioned this briefly in her introduction. It was a project called Black Quotidian, Everyday History in African American Newspapers. Quotidian means something that's ordinary or that happens every day. This project was published digitally by Stanford University Press. You can actually find it for free at the web address on the bottom of the screen, blackquotidian.org. For this project, I was looking back through historical African-American newspapers, papers like the Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, or here in Cleveland, the Cleveland Call and Post, to try to get a sense of how black communities were understanding history as it unfolded in the 20th century. When I was looking at those newspapers from the World War II era, I kept coming across images that looked like this. Pictures, stories about some of the more than a million black men and women who served their country in World War II. This is from the Minneapolis Spokesman, which is the longest, the longest, largest, the longest running black newspaper in Minneapolis. I'm from Minneapolis, so I had to give a shout out to my hometown. Um, now, I'm a historian. I've taught about this topic for more than a decade. But it wasn't until I kept coming across images like this that I realized how much there was to this story. I came across dozens and eventually hundreds of these. These weren't famous people. These were average men and women from Cleveland, from Los Angeles, from New York, from Minneapolis, who went and served the country during World War II. These are not names that appear in our history textbooks. This made me curious. It was about seven years ago. It made me curious. It made me wonder, what more is there to learn about the story that we don't already know? That's what sparked my curiosity and led to the research that resulted in Half American. As Karen mentioned, one of the things that showed up in the black press in this time period 
was a letter written by a man named James G. Thompson. He was a 26-year-old from Wichita, Kansas, and it was late December 1941, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He realizes that he and other black Americans are about to be drafted into a military. And it's a military that's racially segregated throughout the war. And so he writes this letter to the Pittsburgh Courier that asks a series of very pressing, pointed questions. He asks in part, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Is the America I know worth defending? What he was asking was, what does it mean to fight for and potentially die for a country that treats you as a second-class citizen? Now, the great historian Stephen Ambrose has said that the greatest irony of World War II is that you had the world's largest democracy in America fighting against the world's worst racist, Native Hitler, with the segregated army. Men and women like James Thompson were living that irony. They recognized the hypocrisy at the time. This isn't just something that historians like me realize in the last couple decades, it was apparent to him in Kansas in 1941, this is unfair. I'm being drafted to fight in a military that's racially segregated. The Pittsburgh Courier, in turn, uses Thompson's letter to launch the double victory campaign, which becomes the rallying cry for black Americans during the war. Double victory, hopefully many of you have heard of before, it means that black Americans are fighting for both victory over fascism abroad, but also victory over racism at home. That's what the double V stood for. Now again, as a teacher, I've taught about this in the classroom, but it wasn't until I got into the research for this book that I realized how profound that double victory campaign was. It wasn't just a clever slogan or a rhetorical device. Black Americans were truly fighting two wars at the same time. They were absolutely committed to trying to gain military victory. They recognized that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis had to be stopped. But they also recognized that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to defeat the Nazis on the battlefield and then come home to a similar version of racial discrimination and white supremacy here in the United States. They recognized that that battle at home had to be ongoing. That's what the Double Victory Campaign was about. So in my presentation today, I want to talk about three of the key arguments that I try to make in the book. The first is that from the black perspective, we have to start the story before Pearl Harbor. Now, if you open almost any US history textbook, we start the story of World War II from the American perspective on December 7th, 1941. It's obviously an important moment, but that's not the starting point of the war for most black Americans. If you looked at black newspapers from the 1930s, you would see extensive coverage of the rise of fascism in Europe. This is from 1933, from the Norfolk Journal and Guide, making direct connections between Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan in the United States. Black Americans were among the first to recognize the very serious threat that Hitler and the Nazis posed because they understood that Hitler was explicitly drawing on American racial policies to help justify his treatment of Jews in Europe. Whether it was segregation of Jews on train cars, theft of Jewish property, violence against Jewish communities, all those things showed up in the black press in the 1930s. Black Americans were sounding alarms as early as 1933 that this isn't something that's a problem just for Europe, this is an international problem. Fast forward a couple years later, in 1936, the Spanish Civil War starts, when General Francisco Franco's forces stage a coup against a democratically elected government in Spain. This, too, captures the imagination of black Americans all across the country. The headline here is from the Chicago Defender in 1936, saying that Mussolini and Hitler have joined forces with Franco in Spain. There was a group of Americans, about 3,000 Americans, who went to fight in that Spanish Civil War. They were collectively called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Of those 3,000, 80 were black Americans. They uprooted their lives to go fight in the Spanish Civil War in 1936. But importantly, since the Second World War has started, World War scene, right? the five years before Pearl Harbor, black newspapers are talking about this. Average black Americans after church and barbershops and their homes and their workplaces are talking about the Second World War having started. Links and Hughes, who grew up in Cleveland, graduated from Central High, I believe. He's fascinated by this. He becomes a war correspondent for the Baltimore African American. He travels to Spain to report on these black volunteers, because he wants to understand why would these ordinary black people uproot their lives to go fight in another country's civil war? They'd never been to Spain before. They're from Alabama, they're from Georgia, they're from New York, they're from Cleveland. Why would they go to Spain? So he travels there to report on it. Then those stories get published back in the United States. 
I'll highlight just a couple of the people he talks about. Thaddeus Battle was a student at Howard University who paused his pre-med studies to go serve in Spain. He said that the thing upset, that upset him most was seeing the destruction of libraries and books because his parents were educators. They knew how harmful that was. So that's what made him most upset at the fascist regimes that they were destroying these libraries and books. James Bunny Rucker was from Columbus. He was a 25-year-old son of a minister. He was doing construction work in 1936 before he left to go to Spain. Both Battle and Rucker were driving trucks that moved people and, and munitions to the front lines. And so you can just imagine they're living ordinary lives doing construction here in Ohio, and then a few months later, they're on the front lines of battle in Spain. Solaria Key was the only black woman to be part of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. She's originally from Akron, Ohio. She's 23 years old. She did her nurse training in New York. When he was founder, he asked her, why did you go to Spain? She said it was really two reasons. The first is that she was a Catholic. And while she didn't consider herself particularly political, she thought it was her obligation as a religious person to help people in need. Then the second is when she was in New York, she worked alongside a number of Jewish doctors who told her about the horrors of the Nazi regime. That's what motivated her to go to Spain. It's important to know Key, like Bunny Rucker and like a number of these volunteers, went on to serve in the US Army during World War II. And so they're fighting fascism before the start of the war, and they just keep doing it during the war. On the home front, the key thing to mention before Pearl Harbor is the March on Washington movement, led by A. Philip Randolph. So in the summer of 1941, A. Philip Randolph, who was the leading um, labor union leader in the United States among black Americans, head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, thanks, he threatens to bring 50,000 black Americans to march in Washington, D.C., unless President Roosevelt agrees to desegregate the army and desegregate the defense industries. It was a huge deal at the time because there had never been a demonstration of black political power at this scale. Randolph eventually calls off the march in exchange for President Roosevelt signing an executive order that desegregates the, the defense industries. But it's a demonstration of black political power that was unprecedented. All that is in the months before Pearl Harbor. So the first argument is that we have to start the story before 1941, because for black Americans, the war truly started before that. The second is that we have to treat double victory seriously. We have to see the military battlefields in parallel to the home front battles, because that's how black Americans understood it. Perhaps the most famous individual black American to serve in the war was Doris Miller. Now, it's important to understand that in the Navy, black Americans could only serve as mess attendants, which meant that they did cooking and cleaning aboard the ships. It was the lowest rank one could have on the ships. That was all that was available to them. But on the morning of December 7th, Miller emerged as a hero. He was a 22-year-old mess attendant from Waco, Texas. And when the battle started, he went above deck and helped attend to the wounds of, of his injured shipmates. He made a makeshift stretcher to move his captain to a safer spot in the deck. And then when his lieutenant orders him to go to the anti-aircraft gun, Miller goes over there, and even though he has no training on the ship's weapons, he starts firing at the Japanese planes, potentially hitting and downing one of them. It was a remarkable display of, of heroism. The story resonates powerfully for black Americans because the military has gone out of their way to say that black Americans don't have the courage, the bravery, the intelligence to serve in combat. So when Miller's name eventually gets released, the black press says, look, just give us the opportunity and we can help win this war. So Miller is one of the names that really galvanizes black Americans in the months after Pearl Harbor. Now, my favorite thing about being a historian is that you learn new things in the course of your research. Julius Ellsbury is a name that I didn't know when I started this project seven years ago. But it's important to understand that Miller wasn't the only black person at Pearl Harbor. There are nearly 24 black mass attendants who died on the USS Arizona when that ship was sunk. Julius Ellsbury is another one. He was on the USS Oklahoma. Like Miller, he performed bravely on the morning of Pearl Harbor. But unlike Miller, Ellsbury lost his life in that battle. Ellsbury was the first person, black or white, to be killed from Birmingham, Alabama. And this picture, with the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor, was everywhere in black Birmingham in the months after the battle. On the home front, I want to highlight two of the key figures that show up in the book. One is Thurgood Marshall. 
He's best known as the first black Supreme Court justice, but during the war, he was the head of the legal division for the NAACP. And in that capacity, he investigated cases of violence against black troops on these military bases in the South. The conditions that black troops encountered on these military bases was horrific. They described boarding trains in northern cities, and then when they get to southern demarcation points, Washington, D.C., or other cities, having to go to the Jim Crow section of the car. They said they had to pull down the shades when they pulled into these small southern towns so that white townspeople wouldn't throw rocks at the trains. And then they described violence and racial epithets being part of everyday life on the base and then off the base as well. The right side of the screen highlights some of the letters that black soldiers wrote to Thurgood Marshall. They said they felt like they were at war here in the United States while training to go to the war abroad. They said they felt they would be safer once they deployed to the European theater or the Pacific theater than they were in Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. Perhaps the most important person in the history of civil rights that doesn't get enough attention is Ella Baker. She was a key grassroots activist in the 1960s with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But during the war, she was the head of branch membership for the NAACP. The numbers on the right side of the screen give you a sense of how effective Ella Baker was at her job. The number of chapters and members in the NAACP increased dramatically over the course of the war, largely because of her efforts. She was traveling all across the country. That's important because it meant that the largest civil rights organization in the country now had more money to be able to fight larger and more complex civil rights cases. So when we talk about World War II being a turning point for civil rights, what we're really talking about is the infrastructure of civil rights getting built out during the war. One of Baker's key breakthroughs was understanding you didn't need to be a professional class black person to be a leader. You didn't have to be a doctor or a lawyer or a professor. You could be a sharecropper or a barber and be a leader in your community. So she led leadership training workshops all across the South. I'll mention it later, but one of the people who attends those workshops is Rosa Parks in Atlanta in 1945, fully a decade before the Montgomery bus boycott. So Baker's help helping to plant the seeds of the civil rights movement that emerges in the 50s and 60s. This is important because there's a tremendous amount of racial tension and racial violence going on in the United States during the war. We have a false sense sometimes that, the, that World War II was a time of great racial unity. It emphatically was not. In 1943 alone, there are more than 240 cases of race riots or racial attacks in big cities and small towns. The one highlighted here is in Beaumont, Texas. This is an image from the Baltimore African American depicting an uh, American flag that was outside a black business. It was a radio shop in the black part of Be Beaumont that was burned to the ground, and the flag almost alongside with it talking about the, the hoodlums who, who did this and how would they question patriotism that way. This inspired Langston Hughes to write a poem called From Beaumont to Detroit. And I want to read it to you because I think it gives you a good sense of what the double victory campaign looked like at the time. So Hughes wrote, looky here, America, what you done done. Let things drift until the riots come. Now your policemen but your mobs run fee, free. I reckon you don't care nothing about me. You tell me that Hitler is a mighty bad man. I guess he took his lessons from the Ku Klux Klan. You tell me Mussolini's got an evil heart. Well, it must have been in Beaumont that he got his start. Because everything that Hitler and Mussolini do, Negroes get the same treatment from you. You Jim Crowed me before Hitler rose to power, and you're still Jim Crow and me, right now, this very hour. Yet you say we're fighting for democracy, then why don't democracy include me? I ask you this question because I want to know how long I got to fight both Hitler and Jim Crow. It's such a powerful poem because it encapsulates in just these few verses what was on the minds of black Americans during the war. This is what the Double Victory Campaign was about. It was about fighting to win the war, but also calling out the hypocrisy that was everywhere evident in the country at the time. And while this is going on in the home front, the war is still going on. Black Americans are playing a vital role in helping to win it. Now, everyone's heard of the D-Day invasion, June 6, 1944. There are about 2,000 black Americans who are part of that invasion. If you look at images of the landing, 
You see those funny-shaped silver balloons that are hovering over the ships? Those were manned by a black unit called the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. These were helium-filled balloons that dangled wires from them that had mines attached to them. The purpose of these was that Nazi planes couldn't drop low enough to strafe the ships and the men who were landing on the shore. One of the people in that unit performed bravely on the morning of D-Day, a man named Waverly Woodson Jr. He was a medic. He was wounded as the ship was coming to shore. But despite those wounds, he set up a medical aid station on the beach and worked for 30 hours consecutively, tending to the wounds of more than 200 men. His commander at the time recommended that he receive the Medal of Honor, but that request was denied. There are 433 Medals of Honor that were awarded during World War II. None of them were awarded to black troops. I'll mention later that in the 1990s, thankfully, the military conducted a review and ended up promoting seven people to the Medal of Honor. Again, these are things that were alive to black Americans at the time. This was in black newspapers. People understood these stories of heroism. D-Day just stood for Day of the Invasion. There was still D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and it was in the weeks and months thereafter that really turned the tide of the war. Black troops were absolutely vital to that stage of the battle because they were the backbone of the Allies' supply and logistical effort. One of the arguments I make in the book is that World War II wasn't just a battle of strategy and will, it was a battle of supply. When you understand from that perspective, it's evident that black Americans helped to win the war. The group highlighted here is a group called the Red Ball Express. This was a truck convoy driven primarily by black troops. They moved 400,000 tons of ammunition, food, and fuel in the weeks after D-Day. It's what made it possible for the Americans to move so quickly across France and eventually into Germany. The reality is that almost everything the Allies moved passed through the hands of at least one black American. Without those black troops, the Allies' supply effort would have ground to a halt. And this was recognized at the time. Langston Hughes wasn't the only black war correspondent. This is Ollie Stewart, writing for the Baltimore African American, talking about this miracle of supply. He said, although port battalions and work troops are not generally regarded on par with frontline combat troops, it is a matter of record that no group of soldiers in this theater has done more to make possible Allied victory. They liberate no towns, see no flags, drink no champagne, nor kiss happy girls. Yet when things become critical, the first cry of high command is, give us more supplies. A similar thing was true on the home front. More than a million black Americans worked in defense industries, including 600,000 black women. These are some of the black Rosie Riveters working at a shipbuilding facility in Richmond. These were particularly important jobs for black women during the war, because this kind of industrial work, factory work, was almost entirely off limits before the start of the war. One of those war workers was Rosa Parks. She worked as a civilian seamstress at Maxwell Air Base in Montgomery. By that point in the war, 1944, the buses on Maxwell Air Base were integrated. And so Rosa Parks described being able to sit wherever she wanted to on the base, on the buses. But when they got to the Montgomery City Line, then she had to transfer to the back of the bus. She said in just that one block, it was like going from being a first-class citizen to being a second-class citizen. Her brother, Sylvester, fought in the Pacific Theater. But when he came home, he couldn't get a job and couldn't buy a home. And so this made Parks aware of how much needed the change in America after the war. She said, I'd always been taught that this was America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I felt that it should be actual in action rather than just something that we hear and talk about. The largest unit of black women to serve in the war was a group called the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion under the command of Major Charity Adams. They deployed to England in late 1944, and their job was to shoot mail all across the European theater. That might not sound like a big deal, but it was actually incredibly complicated because these units were moving constantly, and you had lots of men with common names like John Smith or Mark Adams. And all the troops after the war, black or white, talked about how important it was to receive mail from home to boost morale. So these women made that possible. So I mentioned earlier, during the war, none of the 433 Medals of Honor that were awarded were awarded to black troops. In the 1990s, the Military Conductor Review ended up promoting seven black men from the Distinguished Service Cross to the Medal of Honor. 
So I want to highlight just three of those soldiers today. One was Reuben Rivers. He was a 23-year-old tank platoon sergeant from Oklahoma. He fought through combat wounds and led several tank advances against German positions in northeastern France. He fought with the 761st Tank Battalion that was nicknamed the Black Panthers. They fought for 160 days consecutively across four major campaigns, including the Battle of the Bulge. If I had to vote for the most interesting person to serve World War II, Edward Allen Carter Jr. would get my vote. He was raised by black missionary parents in India and China, so he was fluent in Hindi, Mandarin, and German. When he was 15, he left home to join the Chinese National Army to fight against Japanese incursions in Shanghai. He volunteered to fight in the Spanish Civil War, like I mentioned earlier, and all that's before he turned 21. Just months before Pearl Harbor, he volunteered for the Army, and you would think, with his language experience and combat experience, the Army would have a good role to assign him. And said they assigned him to be a cook in a quartermaster unit, right? which I think speaks to the illogic of segregation. The military wasn't concerned about how best to take advantage of the, the manpower, the people power of black troops. They were more concerned just with the race of someone's skin, the color of someone's skin. Nevertheless, Carter serves in that capacity until late 1944 when the army is desperate. They need more infantry troops, so they finally issue a call for volunteers. Carter was one of 5,000 black men to answer that call for volunteers. He actually gave up his rank in order to do it, went from being a staff sergeant back to being a private, just the opportunity to participate in combat. He's part of a provisional division that's attached to General Patton's 12th Armored Division, and I want to read to you from his commendation so you can get a sense of what he did to earn the Medal of Honor. The morning of March 23, 1945, near Speyer, Germany, the tank upon which Carter was riding received bazooka and small arms fire from a large warehouse across a field. Carter volunteered to lead a three-man patrol to the warehouse. Enemy small arms fire covered the field, killing one member of the patrol instantly. This caused Carter to order the other two members of the patrol to return to the covered position and cover him with rifle fire while he proceeded alone to carry out the mission. An enemy machine gun burst wounded Carter three times in the left arm as he continued the advance. Disregarding these wounds, Carter continued the advance by crawling until he was within 30 yards of his objective. The enemy fire became so heavy that Carter took cover behind a bank and remained there for approximately two hours. Eight enemy riflemen approached Carter, apparently to take him prisoner, but Carter popped up, killed six of the enemy soldiers, and captured the remaining two. Now, I mentioned earlier Carter was fluent in German. He interrogates these troops he's captured in German as he's leading them across the field back to his unit, getting valuable intelligence about where the rest of the German soldiers are stationed to make sure he can help protect the lives of the men in his unit. It sounds like Hollywood movie stuff, but Carter actually did it. The last person I'll mention here is Vernon Baker. He was the only one still alive to receive his medal in person. And initially, when he got the call from the White House, he didn't want to go. He was 77 years old. He said, I performed these actions five decades earlier. You should have honored me then, not now. But eventually, he did choose to go. During the war, Baker was a first lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry. He took out three machine gun positions and led a battalion charge through heavy fire and enemy minefields to help the Allies capture a German mountain stronghold in Italy. One of my favorite quotes in the book comes from Baker. He said, I was an angry young man. We were all angry, but we had a job to do, and we did it. What I like about this, I think it speaks to the reality. These men and women were frustrated. They were angry about the racism and discrimination they faced but they still gave everything they could to help America and the Allies win the war. It was a remarkable form of, of fighting patriotism. So I can say definitively, having spent seven years working on this book, that America wouldn't have won the war without the contributions of these black troops. And we can't talk about the history of World War II without talking about the contribution of black Americans. The last argument I want to highlight is that for black Americans, the war didn't end in 1945. They came home and had to keep fighting. As one veteran put it, they went from fighting in the European theater of operations to fighting in the southern theater of operations. To give you a sense of what they're fighting against, this is Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland on the floor of the Senate in 1945 as the war is coming to a conclusion. He said, Negro soldiers have disgraced the flag of their country. The Negro race is an inferior race. 
I'm proud that the purest form of white blood flows in my veins. I know that the white race is a superior race. It has ruled the world. It has given us civilization. It's responsible for all of the progress on Earth. Now, if these words are upsetting today, and they should be, imagine how they sounded to black veterans who had just risked their lives, seen their buddies killed, fighting for a country that treated them as second-class citizens. They were outraged by it. It's important to understand Eastland's only in the Senate because black people in Mississippi can't vote. Mississippi in 1945 is 48% black. Fewer than 2% of those black Mississippians can vote because of decades of intentional voter disenfranchisement. Poll taxes, violence, lynchings of people who are trying to register to vote. In no meaningful sense of the term is Mississippi a democracy. If it was, Eastland wouldn't be representing a state that's nearly half black. It's also important to understand how vocal and proud Eastland was of his white supremacy. I think sometimes it's easy to talk about racism or white supremacy in kind of abstract senses. Say, oh yes, those things existed in the past or in the present. This wasn't an isolated crank writing a letter to a newspaper. This is an elected US senator with tremendous power voicing some of the most hate-filled rhetoric one can imagine proudly on the floor of the Senate for everyone to hear. This is the country that black veterans came back to. That's why the double victory campaign was important. It was absolutely important to win the war militarily, but black Americans recognized that wasn't enough. You couldn't come home to a country that still treated you as a half American. You didn't want to go back to the way things were in 1945. You had to change the country when you got home. So that whole generation of black veterans becomes leaders in the civil rights movement. They become the foundation of the activism that happens in the generation afterwards. Perhaps most prominently, Meg Grevers. He was just 19 years old when his port battalion landed on Omaha Beach just days after the D-Day invasion. Look how young he is in this photo. He's 19 years old. He was part of that Red Ball Express I mentioned. He loaded cargo for those truck drivers. On his 21st birthday in 1946, after the war, he led a group of black veterans who tried to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, only to be turned away by a white mob with guns. Evers later said, I had been in Omaha Beach. All we black soldiers wanted was to be ordinary citizens. We fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked as though white Mississippians would. Evers, of course, took on increasingly important roles in the NAACP in Mississippi over the course of the 1950s and 60s. He investigated the lynching of Emmett Till in 1955 and kept fighting for voting rights and civil rights until he was assassinated in 1963. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. I'll highlight just three other civil rights leaders who emerged from that generation. One is Hosea Williams. He served in the Army, earned medals for his conduct in the war. He was nearly killed in Savannah, Georgia after the war for drinking from a white oldie water fountain. He helped to co-lead the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, alongside Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. W. Johnson Roundtree was in the Women's Army Corps. After the war, she used the GI Bill to earn a law degree from Howard University Law School, opened up a pioneering law firm in Washington, D.C., and helped to win a number of important civil rights cases. And then Amzie Moore served in the military, in the Army. After the war, he went back to Mississippi and helped fight for voting rights there as one of the leaders of SNCC. And the last person I'll mention is someone who might be familiar to many of you in this room. And I should say, I've given this presentation more than 50 times now, uh, all across the country, in some cases internationally. Um, I've always closed with, with Mr. Madison, and so it's really amazing to be able to do it in Cleveland where people know his name. Right. Today, there are fewer than 120,000 living American World War II veterans, including approximately 10,000 black veterans. And so I want to close by talking about one of them, who is a Clevelander, Robert Madison, who celebrated his 100th birthday earlier this year. On Thursday, when I received the award, Mr. Madison was there, um, which is such a highlight of my life, to be honest. Um, he's someone who I respect so much. Um, so for him to be there was just remarkable. Um, I'm also thrilled to have met his daughter on Thursday night, Jean, who's here today. So Jean, thank you for coming out. Uh, 
And I think it's so important because history is lived by individuals. It's lived by individuals, it's shaped by individuals and communities, and then as the nation. I think it's important to remember those different scales. Right? When I say that there are more than a million black men and women who served in World War II, those are individual stories. Like Mr. Madison's is one of them. Those are individual stories. One of the reasons we're here today in this actual building is because Mr. Madison is one of the many alumni of East Tech. <laughs> and so those individual stories are also rooted in places. Right? There is not Mr. Madison's story without East Tech. Right? In the same way that the stories are going to be written by today's students, to the future alumni, will be written in, in the future as well. So Mr. Madison paused his architectural studies at Howard University to serve as a second lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry during World, the war. He earned a Purple Heart in combat in Italy. After the war, he earned architectural degrees from Case Western and Harvard before returning here to his hometown of Cleveland to establish a trailblazing architectural firm. I learned about Mr. Madison's story from an oral history interview he did with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, they've interviewed dozens of veterans before they have passed away, and Mr. Madison's is one of those interviews that I, that I watched. Um, he was probably in his late 70s or early 80s when he gave the interview. But Mr. Madison described going to a bookstore and going to the big wall of books on World War II. And we all know how many books have been published on World War II. It's a, it's a massive wall. He went there and looked at one of the, the big volumes was flipping through it. He said he didn't see anything in there about black Americans in the war. Nothing about the black Marines, the black airmen, the black women who served, none of it. And the quote that stuck with me, he said, we were a forgotten group of people. I wrote Half American for men and women like Robert Madison, because it's vital that when we talk about this time period in American history, that we remember their stories, that we remember the contributions of black veterans. So I want to close where I started by reminding you that the stories we tell about the past matter. And I'll read just the final paragraph of Half American before we open up for questions. Stories of World War II that do not reckon with the black American experience leave us ill-prepared to understand the present and rudderless as we try to navigate the future. Ignorance is a luxury that we cannot afford. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can meet the resurgence of explicit racism as a deeply entrenched aspect of our country's political history and cultural life, rather than as a prize or an anomaly. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can see modern battles over voting rights and racial justice as the continuation of decades-long struggles to make America an actual functioning democracy. And if we tell the right stories about the war, we can finally honor the sacrifices of the black veterans, defense industry workers, and citizens who fought in foreign battlefields and in their own cities and towns so that no one would ever again be treated as half American. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator, Daniel Morgan, Jr., who's a Tri-C Mandela Honor Student. Let me help you moderate the conversation. Thank you. Is this on? Well, hello again, and hello to all of you. Um, Thank you for that informative presentation. Um, I'm sure I speak on uh, for all of us uh, when I say that. Um, and welcome to Cleveland, and thank you for being here. Um, so thank yeah. You. Um, so I just have a few questions, um, and then we'll go on to the Q&A from the audience. Um, so my first question, uh, what were some of the difficulties you faced uh, while writing this book, and was this the most difficult book you have ever written? So the second question first, it was the most difficult book I've written. Um, they're all challenging in different ways. Uh, I think for this one, to the first question, there's so much that one can say about the history of World War II, even just focusing only on black soldiers and airmen and Marines. 
there's so many stories that I couldn't include in the book. And so I think the big challenge was trying to figure out how to keep a narrative through line so that there was a clear story I was telling. Um, but it meant that there's a lot of amazing things that I found in the research that I just couldn't include in the book. I think that was one of the most challenging parts. And the other challenging part is um, this history is hard in many ways. Um, there are many inspiring parts of the story, but there are also many parts that make you angry as a historian. And so um, just sitting at my desk at home going through these newspaper articles, the archival documents, it's hard not to get frustrated isn't the strong enough word. It's hard not to feel outrage at what um, at how black Americans were treated in the time period. Um, and for me, I won't be able to be able to separate the book from the time period in which I wrote it. Um, obviously, we've all lived through a lot in these past several years, but there's a chapter in the book called Homecoming that describes some of the violence that met black veterans when they came home. There were at least a dozen black veterans who were attacked or murdered uh, in the months after the war. <clears throat> I was writing that chapter in the summer of 2020 um, while Americans are in the streets, people in the streets all around the world protesting the murder of George Floyd, Brand Taylor, and too many others. To see those parallels and just to feel a sense of almost helplessness that will the country ever learn from its, its past, its mistakes, um, that was a hard part too, just to keeping the, um, balancing one's own emotions as a scholar to try to keep going with the book, to not get, um, not get pulled down by everything that's in the news right now. Thank you, that was very helpful information. Um, thank you for, you know, persevering through the challenges, you know, that you faced in order to get this published to inform all of us um, about what had happened and things like that. Uh, what's the Double V's campaign legacy and how does it relate to current events? That's a good question. Um, so in terms of the legacy immediately following the war, I think it does speak to World War II being a turning point um, because the, the civil rights movement obviously existed prior to World War II. Um, black people have been fighting for freedom, for their rights, for as long as they've been in America. But it escalated after the war. Um, and I think a lot of that goes to the, the sense of purpose that came back from the, the end of the war and the Double Victory campaign. So I think that's one of the legacies. When we think about today, um, a lot has changed in many ways. Um, with the military, it desegregates in 1948 with uh, President Truman's executive order. Um, by the end of the Korean War in 1953, the military is fully integrated, which is not to say that racism didn't still exist in the military in those decades, it, not to say it doesn't still exist today. But really from that point forward, the military was on a more forward-looking perspective with regards to racial equity than a lot of other parts of American society. I think the thing that's still there today is there's still so many gaps and inequalities in our country, and, and so many of them still run along racial lines, and so many of them can be traced back to policy decisions that came out of the war, things like the GI Bill, that I think the, the animating power of the Double Victory Campaign, this desire to, to really fight to make America a country that was worth fighting for, I think that remains with us today. Um, and my final question, and last but not least, um, what advice would you give to the younger version of yourself um, or uh, aspiring authors, historians, and educators today? You know, I've done a lot of interviews, and that's the first time I've gotten that question, so I, pre I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> um, all right, don't tell other historians this, but <laughs> when I was a high school student, right when I was in your shoes in college, I didn't love history. Um, in part, that's because I, I thought, I had good teachers, but I thought history meant memorizing dates and facts and those kind of details. That's not actually what history is about. It's about working with evidence and trying to put these puzzle pieces together. It's almost like a detective story. Um, so it really wasn't until I went to graduate school that I fell in love with history and actually learned what it meant to be a historian, to really immerse oneself in evidence and all these materials and try to piece together a story and then try to make it come alive for, for readers. Um, so I think the thing I would tell my younger self is uh, hang in there and try to, try to figure out what all this stuff is actually about. I think that helps all of us, thank you. <laughs> um, now we'll take uh, questions from the audience. If there's any. Uh, yes. Hi, thank you for your research and thank you for your data. Uh, what was it you give suggestions, that was generation traditionalists. And as you know, we're going for five generations, I don't know if they named the last one. 
Um, what would you, through all your research, suggest to this generation, to the generation now going through the struggles that they're going through and we're going through now? Thank you for the question. If there's anyone in the back who couldn't hear it, the question was about what advice might I give to today's generation uh, and the struggles they're going through now um, that we could learn from, learn from the past. I think one of the things I find inspiring about history is how people work together to try to change the things that they saw as problems. Um, I think one of the problems that we have with history sometimes is it's easy to focus on the iconic figures, the Martin Luther King Jr. or Rosa Parks, and only focus on these isolated moments where it appears everything came together and then voila, change happened. When you read books about King or Parks, they worked for decades and decades to try to accomplish things they accomplished, and they were never alone. Right? The, the reality of the civil rights movement, like any movement, is that it required huge numbers of people, right? most, of whom, who, most of whose names don't show up in, in books, um, because it, it requires people to organize all of these, um, all of these things. If you think about something like the March on Washington, Someone had to pack the lunches, right? Someone had to organize the buses, right? That was primarily black women working as leaders in their churches who got everyone, got 250,000 people there, right? Yes, King's speech was amazing, but it was the people on the ground who were the, the backbone. I think that's what I want to make sure people, young people today who see things that they want to change understand, that it's, we need to work together. It's hard to do anything by them, oneself, and it takes time. And that can be frustrating to hear, but it takes time, it takes failure, but it takes the persistence to keep going. Um, I think one of the questions that goes along with that often is, why should we have a sense of hope, or is there a sense of hope? And I think that hope comes through, it has to be earned. Right? It's not just a wishful, like, I hope things get better, but hope comes from dedicating oneself to doing something to make something better or different in the, in the months and years ahead. Yes. Yeah, there's a microphone at the front of the room, folks can use. I'm listening to your saying that it's very difficult. As young people, we didn't want to know much about history. And we also want to connect young people to thinking about history. Do you think that there, with your book and with books similar, do you feel that there is perhaps an, an alternative way that we can connect kids with um, the history, the stories? Um, I'm specifically thinking about um, artificial intelligence or technology in terms of doing that. So if you, you know, if you see that as an avenue for making those inroads. It's a great question. So I, I think I'm open to any and all ways that we can get more people across generations thinking about history and how it can inform how we understand the present and how we might, under, how we might move forward in the future. Um, I, obviously, there's a huge amount of learning that can happen in schools and places like East Tech. Classrooms have never been the end point of education, though. Right, I think particularly when you think about black history. Right? The classroom's always been important, but it's always also been churches and neighborhoods and families and trying to find ways to make sure that one's learning doesn't end when one's formal education ends and that one knows that there's always more that we can learn beyond our textbooks or beyond our classroom. Even if you have the most amazing teachers, there's only so much you can cover in one semester, one year even, uh, or one four-year um, four high school or, or college experience. I think the, the methods today are gonna to be different. The technologies that we have available are, are powerful to be able to expose people to different ways of thinking about, um, about any of these topics, the kind of mapping software so you can go to different communities and have things come up that show you what happened on this street corner in Cleveland in 1945, whatever it might be. I think being creative and, and persistent in our, um, in our efforts to, to share these histories is, is important. And never losing sight of that sense of curiosity. I think, as I mentioned earlier, my favorite thing about doing this as my job is that I'm always learning new things. Right? I, I know a lot more now than I did when I was 35 or 25, but I also learned how much more there is for me. I also know how much more there is for me to learn. And I think trying to instill that sense of curiosity, that it's not about studying for a test. Yes, tests are important, but it's about understanding um, that desire to, to learn more and then to build on what you've learned and figure out how the puzzle pieces fit together. Um, I had the privilege of growing up in Wilberforce, Ohio. So Colonel Charles Shun, the third line graduate of West Point, his daughter was my piano teacher. Uh, and one of my good friends, uh, Joyce Jackson, her father taught the Tuskegee Airmen to fly. I regret that I never interviewed uh, Dr. Jackson. I wish I had. 
So what I suggest to people is you have to interview all the old, and I don't mean old, I'm old, all the old people in your family because they may not have told their stories in the past and they're willing to tell them now. My husband has an uncle who would never talk about being in Korea. Now he's willing to talk about it. He had a Purple Heart. His family didn't know he got a Purple Heart in Korea. So interview all the older people in your family. Sometimes you have to sneak and do it because if you're using it, anything and you're recording them, they stop talking. But, <laughs> but I really suggest that you have to do that because a lot of these stories are going to be lost. We're not going to know them. And they are so important to know. And I really want to thank you for your work. And I was a history major. I'd love to hear that. Um, I will just echo what you said. It's such an important thing to interview people um, in your family. And I was talking to someone out at the table earlier today about how her father had served and, and really didn't talk much about his experience in the war, which is pretty common. Um, that was a common thing I came across in the research. That a lot of black veterans from that war or from Korea didn't talk a lot about it, um, in part because experiences in war can be traumatizing, but also the reception that that generation received was they didn't feel like their story was one that was meant to be celebrated. And so talking to family members, whatever their experiences were, you can learn so much about, about your family's history, about your community's history, and about our country's history, really. How you doing today? Um, a couple questions ago, you were talking about how we always focus on the giants like MLK and Malcolm X. How difficult was it to piece this hit black history together from World War II and if it was difficult, how did you overcome that? Thanks. I historian's favorite question is always about evidence, and so I appreciate you asking about that. Um, so I used three main sources of evidence for this book. One were the black newspapers that I mentioned throughout. What was so powerful about those is they covered every aspect of, of black life. Um, so you saw um, things about black soldiers going off to war. You saw the ones who performed heroically. You saw when people were, were killed. And then you saw the stories of them after the war. Uh, and their, their work as veterans. Importantly, most of them were not famous in any way. And so that was probably the best um, foundation point of research of, of ordinary people's experiences, and then trying to bring those together to, to weave stories out of them. The second set of sources I used were archival documents. So I mentioned Thurgood Marshall, or Ella Baker. For people who are more prominent, they often leave their materials to a library. So the, the Schomburg Library in, in Harlem has a tremendous collection on black history and black culture. I was able to find materials from uh, Baker and, and Marshall there. Uh, and then the third were the oral history interviews I mentioned. Um, so going back to the last point about interviewing people, talking about their experience, that's oral histories. That's uh, one of the best ways to understand things that weren't left in the written record. Those are valuable because you get the experience of someone like Mr. Madison um, and dozens of other black veterans who talked about what their lives were like before the war, during the war, after the war. Then the job of historians is to try to weave those stories together. Um, and I think the... The challenge is always referencing people whose names are going to be familiar to people. So in the book, you'll find Langston Hughes, Thurgood Marshall, um, names that will be immediately familiar. Rosa Parks is there. But then also, my commitment, I think, was to try to bring new names to the foreground, names that should be unfamiliar to you. Because if we only focus on iconic figures, we can get a misguided sense of what black history was about or what American history was about. And I want to try to give a balance to those. Good afternoon. Uh, I am um, an English teacher here at Douglas Technology. And we were fortunate to get copies of your book for our students um, because uh, our, our principal, Dr. Taylor, um, brought this remarkable work to us. I was also fortunate to be in the audience when you received the Anniston book uh, answer, well, excuse me, book awards on Thursday. And uh, it was really quite a coincidence because I did not know when I got the uh, gift of the, of the tickets that I would be able to, to get some acquaintance with your work and the work of the other people, uh, other authors who are doing such a remarkable thing to uplift our culture and um, to bring the stories of ordinary people to, uh, to the masses. Um, we did have the book. We have um, reviewed oral histories. And uh, you can find those histories on the, um, on the internet. 
and that brings the, uh, the story to life for students who don't know who these people are. And um, they become interested in that, that history that is their history. And um, I guess what I'm, my question is, and you kind of answered it, was the challenges that educators have in this day and age where the history is now again being pushed to the side or buried. Uh, what are our challenges in bringing this history to our children and making them understand the importance of that history to their present and their future? And what are their challenges once they hear these histories, once they know um, the struggles that um, we've gone through as a people? What are their challenges to, to make a difference? Thank you for your question. Thank you for the work you do as a teacher. I think the big challenge, I think this is true at every level of education, including at the college level, is giving people a starting point. Um, I think this is why it took me so long to really fall in love with history, is giving students a starting point or an entry point so they can connect with whatever topic it is that you're, you're researching. And I think recognize in a class of 25 or 30 students, those are going to be different starting points. Some students are really going to resonate with that Langston Hughes poem. Right? They're going to be able to see that and think, oh, now, I, now I get it. For some students, they might think of um, uh, photographs, images, the image of Solaria Key, right? her looking right back at you and seeing this young woman, 23 years old, Right? as a nurse from Akron, Ohio, in Spain. For other students, it might be um, the oral history interviews, like seeing someone actually tell their story is so powerful. Or looking at newspaper documents, or archival documents, or letters, whatever it might be. My experience in the classroom is trying to find those different, I almost think of them as ladders. Right? You try to put down ladders to help people grab onto a rung and be able to climb up to, to get more of a story. And then try to help them understand how whatever it is we're reading about has shaped our present, right? What did Cleveland look like in 1945? How's it look today? And, and how, what connections can we make between those two? What did America look like in 1945? What does it look like today? And how, what connections can we make between those two? Um, in some cases, those are really positive things, right? The, the victories that the Civil Rights Movement achieved, a lot of those came out of the work that the foundation was laid in World War II. They were massive in terms of importance. They opened up doors in the decades afterwards that, um, that so many of us have walked through. At the same time, we still obviously have racial inequality today. And so you could think, pointing to something like the GI Bill and how black veterans weren't able to benefit from it in the same way white veterans were. Right? Thinking about, could your grandparent or great-grandparent buy a home? Right? If they could, what did that mean for them? If they couldn't, what did that mean for them? Uh, I think it's trying to get people starting points and get them thinking about what, um, how those short stories have shaped where we are today and where we might go in, in the future. Um, and I think the other part of your question is the, the political landscape that we're in right now. And part of the challenge is having the opportunity to teach this kind of material in the present. Um, uh, I'm grateful that I work at an institution that has some resources. And so Dartmouth has enabled me to send, I think at this point, 5,000 copies of the book to teachers all across the country. Um, so they can, yeah. So that they can have the opportunity to, to bring this history into their classroom, right? So to make sure we're, we're pushing back in the way that we can against the really concerted efforts to try to block this aspect of our, our history. And I think the last thing I would say is that, you know, this is our, our shared history, right? As people in this country, that you can't talk about American history without talking about black history. And that, um, that's a message that we have to keep conveying to students.
So we can protest. We can claim this American flag because we have been in the military. And something I decided to do for my own family is to do a military history. I included my great-great-grandfather, my cousins, and my uncles. And I found out there were political parts I didn't know about. I also found out that there were people who served in the military that I didn't know about. We have a stake in this. And your work puts it to words to pull this all together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. The thing, the thing I pick up on is the idea of patriotism. I think it's so so profound in, in this history and that I think one of the realities for black Americans is that patriotism and dissent have been intertwined. It's not, not as though you, to love the country doesn't mean that you can't criticize it or can't actively work to make it better. And I think that's what's so powerful about this story is that that generation fought, they gave everything they could to win the war. They were so patriotic in that way. But then it was even another level of patriotism because they came home and they fought to make America better. Right. That's, I think, among the truest forms of patriotism one can imagine. Okay. Um, thank you again. And, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.